It's great to be joined today by Samantha Price, who's an evolutionary biologist and also assistant professor at Clemson University. Uh, Samantha, it's so great to talk to you. You know, I've been reading so much uh, over the last years, not only about some of these very uh, large extinct mammals, which are no longer around, and a lot of the context of that reading has unfortunately been reading that that points to humans having a role in the in some of those extinctions but also about the size of whales and i think maybe just as a sort of general introduction to the topic it might be interesting for our audience to hear a little bit about what sort of factors in general uh, control or influence the size that a particular mammal species grows to right well, there, there are a lot of things and a lot of it comes down to sort of the laws of physics. And so on land, uh, a lot of that is to do with the effect of gravity on bone. And so the material properties of bone really sort of constrain how big they can get on land because you just can't move something so big. So some of the, the largest things that ever lived on land, they were dinosaurs, so not mammals, uh, they got up to around maybe 160,000 pounds. Obviously, that's an estimate because we can't weigh a dinosaur. Um, but we think that's sort of close to the maximum size that things can get on land due to those sort of laws of physics and uh, the capacity of bone to be able to sort of hold our bodies up. Um, of course, when you get into the sea and you mentioned whales, they don't have those effect gravitational constraints because of the buoyancy of water. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that we think that things can evolve to be much larger on, on, in water is due to that buoyancy. There are also many other factors as well, but that's one of the key things that sort of put our upper limits, at least on land. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the connection between an animal's diet and food consumption and its ultimate size? And I know that there is a, something called Kleiber's Law, which sort of is a ratio between how much food an animal consumes and how much bigger, how much bigger in terms of body weight it gets. And I'm wondering whether that, I genuinely don't know, does that apply differently if you are a mammal in water versus a land mammal? Right. Uh, so Clive's law, it, it's an interesting um, question. We're not quite sure if it, Kleiber's law really is dictating the upper size. It may actually, so that's all to do with sort of uh, volume of, um, an animal and sort of the bigger you get you're not using as much energy per unit volume and so the idea is that uh, you can eat less nutritious prey i.e plants so not so much prey but you can graze you can get your nutrition from these very abundant plants and um you can extract the energy because you don't need quite as much energy per unit of mass when you're larger because our metabolic rate roughly scales uh, with a three quarters rule to our size. So it doesn't increase as much as uh, as our size does. Um, however, it may just be that plants are just more numerous in the terrestrial environment. And therefore, we're just the big things are just eating the most available things. So it may not be particularly driven by Kleiber's rule. And the way that's very different in the oceans is there is not an equivalent of krill. So these very small, highly nutritious animal protein packets that aggregate in these very large um, uh, sort of uh, groups uh, during upwelling. And that's what these very large whales are eating. And so it may just be the difference in availability of uh, uh, protein. So plants aren't so nutritious, but they're very abundant on land, whereas krill they're very abundant in the oceans and they're much more nutritious. That's interesting. So if we accounted for, if we held level the sort of uh, uh, gravity related constraints that allow whales in water to grow uh, as big as they do, but did a thought experiment assuming a different diet for whales, would that conceivably allow for even larger whales? Or is this sort of the optimal way that we would get the largest whales, given that the large ones eat a lot of krill, as you mentioned? Right. Um, I mean, I don't think we quite know that. Obviously, the largest living vertebrate is the blue whale, and it's the largest vertebrate ever to have lived, and it eats krill. Um, we do have a thought experiment in terms of we have marine herbivores. So the manatees and dugongs, 
and um, they don't get anywhere near the sight of the blue whale. Um, so w we suspect that one of the major driving forces are these sort of aggregations of krill that have led to those absolutely ginormous sizes in the blue whale. As a general principle, do species that live longer tend to have at least the opportunity of growing larger just in the sense that it takes time to grow and the more years you have to do it, the, the larger you could possibly grow? Or does that not seem to be a correlation? It's a very strong correlation. So there is a very strong correlation between um, sort of average age and maximum age and body size. So the largest things are the longest lived because it takes you a long time to get to that size. It takes you a long time to grow to a size where you can reproduce. And so you have a very long sort of um, juvenile stage as well before you can even start to reproduce. Then you can't have multiple offspring. So you're only having one offspring each time you're having a reproductive event. And so it tends to lead to sort of a much longer life. Yes. I know that climate science is, is not your area of expertise, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts, at least with regard to whale size and and ocean, other ocean animals. Do we know how, for example, changes in ocean temperature, ocean acidification, which we've talked with with experts in that field about and mm -hmm. things like the Pacific garbage patch? How does that impact what's going on in terms of uh, of animal size in the ocean? Um. So there are, there's a variety of things there that you asked me in terms of the garbage patch. It's certainly having an impact on whales and other marine organisms in terms of they are eating these often the plastic bags are looking like squid. And so things that feed on squid will, or um, jellyfish will try and eat them. And so things have washed you up and shore with large amounts of garbage in their, their stomachs. And so that is certainly worrying. In terms of what it has uh, for, for size, I'm not so sure, but the climate change potentially could be really important. So there's been a study that showed that these very large whales, the blue whales, they've sort of only evolved over the last sort of four and a half million years ago. And they think that that is really closely linked to the onset of these seasonal upwelling events in the ocean and quite a lot of oceanic changes that led to those greater aggregations of krill. Hmm. And so of course, climate change, anything that affects the ocean currents and the upwelling is likely to have an effect on these very largest whales. And I don't, we don't know what they will be, but everybody is, of course, concerned about that. Is it likely to expect that um, the super large mammals of the past would would reemerge somehow at some point? Like what forces could cause that, you know, whether we're talking about like the the large arm, armored mammals of the past or glyptodons or or the ground right. sloth i mean what 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 might make these resurface or are these basically things of the past um well i mean the obviously the the physical constraints are going to say the same uh so that is the um true so it's then all about sort of the availability basically of food and what they would be living on as well as the predators that would be after them, also diseases that may be affecting them. Um, there really is no reason to expect that we wouldn't see the evolution of large things again. As you mentioned in the introduction, a lot of the sort of land mammals that recently went extinct have been linked to human evolution and as sort of driving the helping to drive the extinction of things like the mammoth and the mastodon and things like that. So there's no real theoretical reason why those shouldn't re-evolve other than the fact that probably humans are are preventing that by um, changing the habitat. You, we don't have these vast savannas that things can survive in. You know, in Africa, we still have some of those places. That's where the elephants and the giraffe and our largest land mammals are. For species, particularly mammals, that have been around for, for a long time and, and have not gone extinct, uh, do we know whether the average member of a particular species is larger or smaller now? So, for example, if we compare blue whales now to blue whales of millions of years ago, or the African elephant today compared to an older elephant, in general, what direction is size going? 
Ah, oh, well, there are a lot of theories on that. I mean, with the whales, we don't have, we have a fantastic fossil record through the history of whales, but for the modern species, we generally don't have a great fossil record that we can identify, oh, we know this is the blue whale a million years ago. Mm. So that's a little hard. Um, what we can do is we can see that different um, environments lead to the selection for different size. So on islands, what we see um, for elephants, and we can see this in the fossil record of elephants, is that they get smaller when they move onto islands. So islands are a lot smaller, so there's just sort of not that sort of availability of habitat and food, and so they tend to evolve much smaller sizes. And, um, but small things, small mammals, when they get onto islands, often get quite big. Um, and that may be a release of constraint from other predators or, or various other um, aspects to that. Absolutely so fascinating. That that is so. So basically, there's no answer in general for mammals. It depends on what animals we're talking about. Right. I, 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 there is a, a very long-standing hypothesis since um, the sort of late 1800s, called um, by a pretty famous paleontologist called Cope, and um, he his hypothesis is that mammals have been getting bigger through time, um, but. Uh, the evidence for that is somewhat controversial. And so some people think there is really strong evidence and others um, are, are less sure. So I certainly wouldn't like to say that they have been getting bigger throughout time. But there's certainly some trends in certain groups, though, they are getting bigger. Spoken with with a tr in a truly diplomatic way, I would say. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I understand. Samantha Price is an evolutionary biologist and also an assistant professor at Clemson University. Thanks so much for talking to us about some of the work that you do. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.